So I'm thinking about moving here already. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So actually, I have uh, I have many things to say, and then I really probably I'm too greedy. I prepare a lot of things, and um, but now I have a better idea about about what I what I should talk about, and then and then so I'll try to to deliver so what. So the, 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 the interesting areas or topics are within the control of ensemble or population systems that might be related to what you are doing. So I'll try my best and I'm poor in biology. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so in system science and, uh, and engineering, actually, so in, in past decades, so research uh, has been focused on the modeling and control of just a single or a small number of systems. And this is a, a typical application is to design an input that will steer this system from an initial state to a desired target state. So this is very typical and this is very, um, this is quite straightforward actually. Okay, so now in recent years, uh, we have seen uh, a lot of uh, complicated systems like brand and social networks of tremendous scale and they are prevalent in nature and human society. And these are uh, these complex systems or, or, or networks. Actually, they are often constituted by a large number of structurally identical or structurally similar dynamical units. So we have we are seeing a, a significant shift of research towards uh, analyzing or controlling collective behavior of population systems. So here are some uh, widely observed population systems, right? So, so neurons, uh, cell population, group animals, robots, and wind farms and social networks. So there's a common uh, a feature in all these systems. So, so the system actually contains a large number of identical units, right? And so the control in many application domains, the control and observation uh, can only be implemented at the population level through, for example, through broadcasting an input signal, such so as a common signal broadcasting to the entire population, right? So each node actually is receiving the same input, right? Or through receiving aggregated measurements in this way. So this is an illustration of, uh, of uh, a recording of spiking activity in a population of neurons, right? So you record this on spiking activity. And if you look at the top view, right? So these are the spikes. And then in, in, in many cases, actually, the, the spiking activity can be monitored as a whole, right? So like this, but the activity of each individual neuron might not be known, right? So you can, you can just observe this as a population level measurement, right? Okay, then, um, so under these uh, restricted control and observation scenarios, uh, a fundamental question to ask is as follows, right? So if we have a population system, can we design inputs so that we can take off the populations from the same initial state to a common final state, right? Or can we do more? Can we do pattern formation? Can we take this pattern and then we switch this pattern to another pattern and then we we do another transition to separate this into another path. So, so these are common questions uh, to ask, and this is a more realistic um, example, right? So if we consider a population of neurons, and then initially they might be spiked randomly, right, in a random fashion, and we wanted to know whether it is possible to induce desired spiking patterns like this. Can we spike all of them simultaneously, or can we create any arbitrary synchronization patterns with high spatial and temporal precision, right? So this would be uh, of interest in neuroscience. And I'll, I'll give you more examples. Uh, so the first one is uh, in the quantum domain, right? So in uh, MR spectroscopy and imaging, so a typical goal is actually to apply uh, something called radio frequency field and you want it to excite the entire population on this order from an initial state to a desired final state, right? And then this is a very important uh, step towards uh, unfolding protein structures or medical diagnosis. 
and brain stimulation, right? So, so um, this is to uh, affect or to desynchronize thousands of neurons in the brain, right? So that that cause uh, some pathological synchrony, right? And so in training a population of circadian cells, right? So we have a population of cells with different, slightly different clocks. And how can we design inputs so that we can entrain all of the clocks into the a uniform clock, right? And also in cancer therapy, so 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 uh, the, the 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 treatment might not be uh, so the cancer cells might have different response to 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 a common treatment, right? So how can we design a treatment strategy so that the response to the treatment will be uniform, right? Okay, and many more, right? In mechanical systems, in robotics, right? So senseless manipulation, and then you do this uh, rolling ball, right? So you have a single control to control a group of systems simultaneously, right? So all of these are within this uh, application domain, right? So controlling ensemble system. Okay, so these, these are the, the main challenges. Let me recap, right? So the first one is the underactuated nature of the control, right? Again, so we can only apply very, very few inputs or a single input, but we wanted to manipulate uh, a huge population, right? And the second one is lack of state feedback, right? So for each individual system, imagine that if we had thousands of systems, if we wanted to measure each individual system, then we have to put in uh, thousands of sensors, right? So this is uh, impractical. So this requires too many sensors. So in practice, actually, we can only uh, collect such aggregated measurements, snapshots, right? So can we use this to, to, uh, to estimate the system dynamics or to design a robust control strategy, right? And also the lack of mathematical models, right? So in general, uh, it's very hard to, for example, to model the brain dynamics, right? But we could have many, many data av available to us. Can we pass from the data to write down a mathematical model, right? So, so these are challenges. Okay, so here are the, here comes my, the goals of my talk, right? So I, I plan to actually to formally introduce the notion and mathematical formulation of ensemble control problems. And the second part, I will, I will, uh, yeah, I will go over this uh, quickly without too much technical <laughs> detail. So I will present some uh, uh, state of the art methods in analyzing controllability and to optimal control design. And I will show you uh, a lot of simulation results, a lot of videos, uh, animations and also show you some real experimental results. Uh, and then I will talk about this, uh, our recent work on moment-based methods for, for controlling ensembles. And if time permits, I, I will talk about data-driven uh, for network inference. Okay, so here comes, I have a few slides uh, with some math. So, so this is a harmonic oscillator. So if you are familiar with, uh, with linear systems theory, so, so this is the model. And then U and V are the, are the control input, right? So in this case, if we wanted to design this pair U and V so that we can check this system from this initial state to this desired target state, similar to the first uh, animation that I showed, right? So this is a very, very straightforward problem. It's very easy to check that this system is controllable, meaning any pair of initial and target states can be reached, right? So, and then it's very easy to write down a minimum energy uh, control law, right? So this problem is very, very simple. Okay, so now if we consider a population of these, right? So if we take many of these, and then it looks like this, right? And we put this into a big system, right? So they, these are the motions, right? So now when the number of these oscillators goes to infinity, and this matrix becomes an infinite dimensional matrix, right? So we, we wanted to ask the same question. So is this ensemble system still controllable? and how to construct an open and an optimal control law, right? So these are the natural questions that we wanted to ask. Right? Okay, so then, um, so this is the formal formulation of the ensemble system, right? So I take one system, and then this is, uh, this is the dynamical law that this system follows, right? And beta one is the parameter. And I take the second system, and this second system follows the same dynamical law. 
and controlled by the same input, but the parameter value is slightly different, right? So for example, the frequency of this one may be different from the frequency of this one, right? So beta i's are other, other parameters, right? And then if we can check n of these, right, a finite number of these, right? So now when n goes to infinity, right? So we have a huge number of even finite, yeah, finitely many or infinitely many, and we can actually write this as a parameterized system of this form, right? So this is a family of, uh, of uh, dynamical systems or control systems indexed by beta controlled by the same input u, right? So this is the formal inform, uh, form formulation. And then the idea is that uh, in the classical system, if we only consider one system, and then we are starting uh, the problem of steering or controlling this system between two points, in Rn, right? So now we are trying to control or to steer systems between two functions, right? So the functions are the functions of beta, so the population function, right? And then, uh, so this is this is controllability. So yeah, so we say that this system is controllable if if there exists uh, an input, they can steer the system from any initial function to a neighborhood of target function, right? So 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 now we are trying to steer the the system from this function of beta to another function of beta, right? So, so later on, you are going to see why these are, why this is related to, how this is related to the, the applications, right? Anyway, so, so these are the, the definition with respect to different topologies. So I, I, let me skip that. So, um, okay, so, so in the following slides, actually, I, I just wanted to show that um, probably I should, should I skip this? Uh, this is very, very system theoretic stuff. So anyway, so I wanted to show you that, uh, so the controllability can be studied uh, by, by techniques of polynomial approximation. So I think I should, uh, I should skip this actually. Okay, so this is what I wanted to show. Okay, so we started this system. So this system is, uh, is a system, uh, modeling the evolution of a population of nuclear spins, right? So this is called the Bloch equation. Okay, and then, so you can see that there are two parameters, omega, uh, actually omega denotes Lamort frequency. Actually, uh, so we consider a population of nuclear spins with frequencies uh, lying in this range, right? So that is omega and epsilon, is called RF inhomogeneity. When you apply a field, and the field could be inhomogeneous, right? So there are two parameters, right? And then, so this is actually a population of systems with different values of omega, different values of epsilon, right? And then we actually, we have already shown that this system is actually controllable, meaning in the context of MR spectroscopy and imaging, so this means that any excitation profile is possible. Okay, so so anyway, so so this is very very important. So if you if you take a population of nuclear spins and then they are sitting in the equilibri equilibrium state, right? And then in many applications, we wanted to excite this population of spin systems into a certain state. So now I can say I wanted to do this, and then so so the controllability infers that uh, indicates that all of the any after excitation profile is possible, and this is very important for for pro, for, for uh, MR protein, right? So spectroscopy and for MRI. Right? So I just wanted to show you that, and then so here comes to the uh, uh, the the computation of optimal control, and again, so I can just show you the main idea. So this is the linear system, right? So I have a population. And then I can turn this into this uh, integral equation. Anyway, so then I, so the, the design is basically based on computation of singular values, right? So this is more important. <laughs> okay, so now I take this ensemble of uh, harmonic oscillators, right? And then, so the goal is that, okay, so, so I take this population, I place this population into this uh, configuration, right? So this is X and Y, and then each dot, correspond to, so for example, correspond to different frequency value, right? So, and then I, I think they are like 81 or 101 of these here. And the goal is that I wanted to apply this uh, 
broadcast input, UMV. So UMV is applied to every single one, right? And I want to turn this pattern into this pattern, right? And then, and then this design can be just through very simple singular value decomposition. And it, so, so this is the pair of U and V. And following this input, you can see that you don't know what's going on, but you are sure that after this desired uh, prescribed time instance, so the pattern can be formed. So in this application, actually, so this, although this is a very simple uh, case, this is just a linear case. So you can take a population and then uh, assuming that you know the model, you know the parameter values, and then we can actually design a broadcast input so that you can do any pattern formation, right? So this is already proved. Okay, and then we extended this to, to actually to more complicated systems, meaning to nonlinear systems. Uh, let me skip this. Uh, and I just wanted to show you. Uh, so we we based on this uh these uh, results for linear systems, right? Actually, we can devise another algorithm to solve for any type of systems, for example, bilinear systems, nonlinear systems, and uh, iteratively. So let me, so I still wanted to show you this. Uh, this is uh, in MR, so this is called broadband excitation pulse, right? So you wanted to, you take a population of spins and you wanted to excite all of them from the North Pole to, in this case, to from 0, 0, 001 to 100, 0, 0, right? So this is the this is the control that we computed, right? And then applying this, you can see that they will be steered to the same same point. So I'm just showing you uh, all of these applications, and this is a real experiment in MR protein MR spectroscopy. So anyway, so that's I think this is this is probably more relevant to to uh, to you. So can we design controls or design inputs? to study synchronization or to control synchronization. So this is actually a video from my, my biology collaborator, Eric Herzog. So I remember that this is a, this is a three, day, three days of recording of uh, something called uh, period two protein expression at the uh, microscope stage, right? So this shows the, the, the KDN rhythms. Okay, so the idea is that can we control the rhythms, right? So can we make different spiking or different uh, rhythmic patterns, right? So, so actually that is related to controlling oscillators, right? Because um, so we treat uh, every neuron as an oscillator. So this is the main idea. Right? So if you take an oscillator and that oscillator could be n-dimensional, that oscillator will have a stable attractive limit cycle, right? So like this, this is n-dimensional. And then if you are familiar with a uh, phase reduction technique, for example, you have probably you have heard about Kramoto model. So the idea is that this is n-dimensional and this is a periodic orbit. And actually one can map this periodic orbit to a unit circle, right? So just, you know, you can see the one-to-one -one correspondence, right? So you can actually map this, uh, for a unit circle, and then this n-dimensional system can be reduced to a one-dimensional system actually over this unit circle. So now we take a bunch of these, right? So we consider a population of these, and then we can model circadian cells using this model, actually. So the so theta i, theta is the phase, and this is the oscillation frequency, and then u is the input, and then this is the coupling. So if you consider chromatic models, uh, and actually the coupling would be the sinusoidal wave, right? So here we consider a population of neurons and as oscillators, and we wanted to control synchronization, right? So the idea is as follows, right? So, so the definition of synchronization is that if you take two dynamical systems, in this case, if you take two oscillators, and then these are their trajectories, right? And we say that these two systems are synchronized. So after some time t, if the difference between their trajectory remains uh, a constant, right? So then they are synchronized, right? Initially, they could be they could be uh, totally different. I mean, they are not on synchrony, right? So and then after some time, if the phase, if the trajectory difference remains a constant, then we say that this is a uh, 
synchronized, right? So this is a condition, very simple relation, right? So theta one of t minus theta two of t is a constant when t is greater than some time, right? So after some time, they remain a constant, right? Okay, so then if we wanted to design a synchronization pattern, so for example, if I take these two uh, oscillators, I, I wanted to keep these two oscillators in this relation, right? So over time, so the distance between these two will be fixed, right? And then we can actually formulate this problem as a tracking problem, meaning uh, we can take this uh, reference trajectory. So this is theta d, right? So we can take theta d like this. We can just assign this. So this is from this phase to what perfect sequence? You like to phase lock? This is phase lock, yeah, yeah. And phase lock for all time, after some time, right? So I wanted to lock the phase, right? So the phase relation, right? Okay, so then I'm going to, to create this theta d and my requirement is that uh, theta y minus theta d is a constant. And this relation holds for all of the pairs, right? So anyway, so then this is actually, uh, originally this, this, this could be a very challenging problem to, to, for the design, right? So you wanted to, you have a population of neurons and nonlinear, and you wanted to design inputs so that you can, you can, you can make, make the face lock, right? But, if we look at this in this way, we can formulate this as a tracking problem. So basically, we are just trying to track this trajectory, right? At this at this uh, constant distance. Okay, so so now uh, this is an example where I I took four neurons, uh, half chain, half free neurons, and then they started with the same initial state, but they have different frequencies. And I wanted to design an input so that over time. I wanted to map them to form this pattern, right? So you can see that, so this is the input that I'm applying. And you can see that uh, after many, many cycles, so they started to be apart, right? And yeah, it would take some time. And you can see that finally, the phase pattern is gonna be locked, right? So I'm going to lock this into four groups, right? Uh, for for this type of settings, probably you can you can always do that. Yeah. So because because the idea is that um okay so depend because when you do tracking you do need to tolerate uh some uh. Error. So if you allow that, then they, they will be. Yeah. And then you can, in the same idea, right? So if you take a 100 neurons, right, with different frequencies, and then I can say, okay, so I wanted to create this uh, complete this synchronization pattern, right? And this could be useful for conceptually for deep brain stimulation, right? Because if you wanted to break the synchrony, and this is the most desynchronized case, right? So you get the idea. So you can. From this uh, tracking problem, you just try to make the distance constant, and then you can do whatever you like. Right? So you can assign any different groups, right? Yeah. And the computation is actually very easy. So you just do, yeah. So if you are interested in this, I can, I can, I can show you more. Okay, and then this is a real experiment, experimental result uh, for chemical oscillators, right? So this, is, uh, this, this was done in my collaborator, uh, Dr. Isvan Kiss uh, lab. So he started this, uh, chemical oscillators. So in this case, he actually placed this array of oscillators for 20 oscillators. And then these are the, the color bar denotes the initial phase, right? So they are randomly distributed. I mean, the, the initial phase is random, right? And then if you put these oscillators uh, on this uh, phase circle, they look like this. So these are the initial conditions. And these are the color, color codes, right? And then the application here is to show that we are able to design a waveform so that we can turn this pattern into O and then switch this to K and then switch this back to O. So we just wanted to demonstrate that actually we can do this. And so you can see that this is a, this is a real experimental result. So if, you, if we apply, we design this input, right? So a global input applying to these 20 oscillators and you can see that actually we can turn the pattern to K and then we can switch it back to all, right? 
So there are, there are some uh, uh, further applications along this line. So, so they could be related to information encoding. So you can encode actually your information inside this uh, array of isolators, right? So for example, you, if, if initially, if you are given this, right? And then you do need to use this pass key. The pass key is your waveform. You do need to use, use this pass key in order to reveal this information in this, uh, in this oscillator network, right? So, so this is also for, there are applications for information encoding for cybersecurity. So that could be along the way. And, uh, and the next topic is uh, moment-based and data-driven ensemble control. Okay, so this is our recent work. And the idea is that, so earlier on, you have seen this, right? So if you take a population of oscillators, right? And then we, I have already shown that we can design an open loop control that will be broadcasted, uh, broadcast to, to the population, and then you can form this to this, right? But now if we, have this kind of measurement data, right? Can we use this measurement data to do the same thing or to do a better job, right? And know that actually in this case, we do not necessarily need to know the model, right? So in this case, I have a well-defined model. I have everything well-defined, meaning the parameter range and I know everything. And if that is the case and I can design, so now if I have a population system, right? So like your population of cells, and then you actually don't know their dynamics. You, I don't need to know their model, but I can measure this, uh, that I have snapshots, right? So how can I use this to do this, for example? Okay, so here's the idea. So this is just a generic model, right? So we, don't, we can forget about that, right? So now with these measurements, the idea is that actually we can compute moments. By right? moments, meaning you take this data, you compute the mean, you compute the second, you compute the, uh, the variance, right? And you compute the third moment, fourth moment, you can compute as many as you want, right? So directly from the data. And then, so theoretically, so I can say, okay, so if I have a model, right? And then I'm going to be able to compute all the moments and I can write down a system for the moments, right? So this moment M is actually M contains the first moment, second moment up to uh, as many moments as you want, right? So this is an infinite sequence, right? Okay, so I can write down the moment equation. So this is my moment system. And then, so what I wanted to study is that, so initially I, I'm starting this system. Right? And I can, I wanted to turn this system from this pattern to this pattern. So this pattern could be like the star, this pattern could be like the maple leaf, right? So I wanted to do this, but now I might not be able to do this directly because I do not have the system equation, right? And I wanted to study whether I can do this through this moment system, right? So instead of controlling this system from here to here, can I find the corresponding uh, state in the moment system? And I wanted to control from this moment to this moment, right? So the idea is that if I can do this through the moments, then I can, in general, actually I'm doing this for the system, right? So this is a, this is a rough idea. And actually this can be done. Uh, so this is a proof of that. So, so if you check a system and then we can write down the moment equation and then we borrow this uh, very nice uh, uh, results from the moment, moment problem, right? So this is called house of moment problem. So in this problem, the, the result is that if you have a distribution and then the distribution can be uniquely determined by the moments. I'm just talking about the, the moments, yeah. But no, but if this is an n-dimensional system, so you have, you have all the cross terms, yeah. Right, so, so so now, yeah, so, but I mean, you can, theoretically, you can, you can extend that too, if you, you can, you can have the cross terms, but now, yeah, so you're right, so here, I don't have that, so I only have, I only have the, the variance code, yeah. Okay, so now, if I have, uh, if I have this moment system, right, so the idea is that, uh, 
So under some conditions, I can actually represent a distribution by using moments, right? Okay, so look at this. So if we have this kind of data, actually we can treat this data as some samples of certain distribution, right? So this could be samples of some distribution. So these are samples of some distributions, right? And then because my goal is, is to take this moment system and I want it to make this system to turn from this, this moment, this initial sequence to this final sequence, right? So, so this is, uh, so any distribution is uniquely determined by the moments. Right, so what we need to do is that if, because this is a, a unique representation, so we just need to control, if, if we can control this moment to this moment, that means that we can control the original distribution from this to that, right? So this guarantees the, 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 uh, if and only if relation, right? So let me show you one example that, uh, okay, so this is, uh, the same harmonic oscillator example. Uh, we take a population of harmonic oscillators, but now uh, this is the initial state, and then this this is the final configuration that we wanted to reach. Right. So this is still very preliminary, right? And in this case, we assume that we can over time we have the measurement data. So now it's so we started to evolve the system, right? And then assuming that we can collect this uh, uh, match snapshot data. And then we actually use this to design this control. So the idea is that, um, so let me go back. So we got this uh, aggregated measurement, right? and we can compute moments. And then, um, so in order, so the, for the control design, actually we can just easily take a linear combination of moments. So imagine that. So if you wanted to, if you have a population, right, and then you wanted to take this population, if you have, if you have. Uh, So if you have uh, four systems, right, starting from here, and you said that you wanted to take this to, to a single position, and what you need to do is to, actually this is a very simple case, right? So what you need to do is to guarantee that you are going to steer the moment. So you have to make sure that the moment of this, right? so actually there are four of these, and they are centered around on the same point. So the moment, the mean, is actually equal to zero, and the and the variance is also equal to. Zero. If you can do this, and then you can guarantee that all of them are going to. Do. But if you wanted to do more complicated patterns like the the maple leaf, and then you have to utilize a lot more moments in order to achieve that. So that's the basic idea. Any questions? <laughs> Right, so the, the, the good thing is that um, so we really do not need to we do not need to know the dynamics, right? So we don't need to know, okay, so you are, the equations for you for the for the cells, equations for the for the for the neurons, right? We don't need to know that. So as long as we can take pictures and then we have this data and then we can write down the moment equation and then we can use the moment to infer the original dynamics and to do the discussion. Yeah. You mean uh, this uh, like this? Yeah. So, okay. So you can write this as um, you can represent this by using uh, a sequence a sequence of moments, right? So, so for example. Uh, let me show you this example right here, right? So, so from this, this is this this is a this is this is the classical moment problem, right? So the idea is that if you have a distribution, so now uh, when I define the moments in this way, actually I I treat so beta is my random variable. So beta the beta is the parameter, right? So beta is that my random variable, and then this is my distribution, x is my distribution, right? So when I define the moments in this way, right? So the idea is, is that, okay, so 
what I need to do is that I wanted to switch the system from this pattern to this pattern, meaning from this particular distribution to this particular distribution, and I can find a unique uh, sequence of moments that determines this. And this is another unique sequence that determines that, right? And then as long as this is set, right? And then what I need to do is to work on this system, right? And then I just need to study the steering from this, meaning this sequence to this sequence. As long as this is done, then actually you are able to do this because you, you, you write this as a sequence, you write that as a sequence, and as long as this is done, then apply applying the moment control back to the back to the origin whatever system you have you can you, you can get that okay so this is the last topic that i wanted to talk about uh this is uh data driven learning and inference so this is our recent work in net, networked inference right okay so here's the problem so if we have a network, right? And then we have a time series recording for each node, right? So for example, if there are 100 nodes and then we have 100 time series recording, and given this data, can we recover the connections? Can we recover this topology over time? Right, because the coupling strength between nodes could be varying over time. Right, so 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 can we actually from data can we infer time varying connections of the network, and can we learn spatial temporal information, and can we discover dynamic structures, meaning for example synchrony, right? Then can we learn um, the model? Right, so these are very interesting questions that um, that we could ask. Okay, so our approach is actually very simple. So it's, it's based on, it turns out that it, this can be done by, by a kind of regression, right? So, so this is a generic model that we, we can see there, but actually, so here, this one hypothesis, the hypothesis is that, so this is the dynamics of each node, and the dynamics of each node depends on its self dynamics. Right, so this is the self dynamics and the coupling dynamics. Meaning, so for example, if, if you take three nodes, right? So X1 evolves according to its own dynamics plus K12, K21, the effect from K12, K21, and K13 and K31, right? So this is our general assumption, right? So you have a network and the network is, uh, is related, the dynamics is, is related to its self dynamics and the coupling dynamics. Okay, so now that I, so we wanted to, given data for X1, X2, and X3, so given three time series data, we wanted to infer these coupling functions as well as this, right? So the, mean, know, know that the coupling functions are actually time dependent, right? So because these, these are, these connectivities are, are changing with time. Okay, so the idea is very simple. So now I'm going to take this coupling function of two variables, I will expand this by using an orthonormal basis, right? So this is a two-dimensional orthonormal basis, and I'm gonna expand the nature dynamics f using just a one-dimensional orthonormal basis. Meaning, for example, if the system is oscillatory or periodic, right? And then you can choose Fourier expansion, right? So the idea is very simple: you take f. And then you just expand this by using Fourier expansion. You take Kij, you, you expand this by using a two-dimensional Fourier expansion, right? And as long as the, the bases are determined, actually, if you plug this in, and finally, this is the dynamics, right? So this is the equation xi dot equal to this, right? And because we have already chosen those basis functions, meaning, for example, we have already decided to use Fourier, two-dimensional Fourier, and what remains to determine would be this coefficient, right? So anyway, so we can decode actually this problem into, so for each node, I can write this into just this uh, very simple least squares problem, right? So if you are considering a huge network and actually we can do this in parallel, so the estimation of 
for each node, for example, now if I pick this node, right, I wanted to estimate uh, all of the connections into and 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 out of this node, as well as it's not self-dynamic, right? So for each node, we can decode this into a very simple regression problem, right? And then we can do this simultaneously, meaning in parallel, right? And right, so this is how y is actually the data that we have. And, and this A matrix is the matrix containing all of the basis that we have chosen, meaning the Fourier, Fourier basis, right? And then Z is the coefficient that we wanted to determine. And then we just, uh, basically we are just doing the data fitting, right? So this is originally a nonlinear estimation problem, and then we can just turn this into a very simple linear problem. And, uh, and I'm going to show you uh, a few, a few, uh, simulation and experimental results, right? So here, so this is just a test bed, right? So we, we generate synthetic data, we, we generate fake data, right? We know the solutions and we apply the technique to do the recovery. And then actually this is, um, yeah, so of course we can get a very accurate results. This is just to validate and then so let me show you this. So this is a case where we start this social synchronization. So the idea is that, um, we actually put, uh, so my collaborator, so he, he took, uh, five mice into one cage and co-housed them for 65 days. And then he did seven of these. And then he wanted to study whether these groups of mice are socially synchronized after, after these, uh, actually 78 days, right? 68 days. So he wanted to understand whether they are socially synchronized. Right, whether meaning whether they like each other, right? And actually, the idea so is to to look at this through their temperature rhythms. So so they put mice together, and then he collect locomotion data activity, right? And then that would turn into the temperature variation. So whenever he sees that. After the co-housing, their local lo lo locomotion activities and their temperature variation uh, are kind of synchronized, and then they conclude that this group of mice is socially synchronized, right? So what we did is that he collect all of the locomotion data and then also the temperature data time series, and then we use those data uh, to recover the network, right? So for example, there are five mice in a cage, so then the there are five nodes, right? And then we use the data and then we recover the networks, right? So we have four cases of connected networks. We have three cases of not connected networks, right? And then so our conclusion, then we can, oh, okay, so these are synchronization index. Actually, our conclusion was that these four cases are socially synchronized, while these three cases were not, right? And actually this matched uh, their experimental observations. And this is another experiment uh, from, from uh, Dr. Herzog. So again, we study uh, circadian networks, right? So actually, he, so this is a, he gave us a network of 700 nodes. Okay, and then we wanted to use the oscillation data to infer the network topology over time, right? And then from the estimation, we can identify uh, hubs, right? So the these dots represent uh, those nodes that are highly connected, right? And okay, so this is actually the left hand side brain, the head left SCN, and this is the right hand side brain. So the idea, so actually, uh, in their hypothesis, the connectivity within uh, this brain or this part of the brain is stronger than between, right? So, and actually we identified that. So we, we took the data, we recovered the network topology, and then we observed that within, within the, the left-hand brain or right-hand side brain, actually within the brain, the connectivity is greater than between. And um, so we also identified 14 hubs on the left-hand side and 16 on the right-hand side. So of course, I mean, Nobody knows whether these are correct uh, answers, right? So they actually didn't know uh, where are the, the, the hubs 
located, right? But at least we can identify. Okay, so when we do the recovery, actually we recover the clock as 24. So this is one thing that is very good, very close to 24. And then we also identified that within within this or within this, the connections are actually stronger than B, right? So, and then we are continuing doing this uh, to identify actually what are these hubs, right? So those are called VIP cells. Okay, and then, uh, yeah, so this is this is our ongoing uh, research. So, so again, so you can see that, so these, these cells are actually more important in terms of triggering the KDM rhythms. And, and what we are trying to study is that if, if we have a network of, we, if we have the data, can we use our algorithm to locate uh, this important node, right? And then in order to validate whether this, this uh, estimation is correct, actually the, in experiments, like my collaborator, he could do that. So for example, he could take away a few nodes. He can remove some nodes. And then we do the estimation again. And if the nodes that are removed, after removing some nodes, if the network is not synchronized anymore, that means that what has been removed will be these hubs, right? So we can do this by actually uh, one by one because I mean in experiments, I think they can they they cannot simultaneously shut down or or remove uh, multiple nodes, right? So we can do this one by one, and then we know that as you can see, more important nodes are actually in the bottom of the brain. Yeah, so this is ongoing uh, work that we I'm doing with my neuroscience and biology collaborators. Okay, so I think I'm done. So this is uh, this is my concluding remarks. So I wanted to say that uh, actually to to tell you that controlling collective behavior and engineering dynamic structures, meaning synchrony, right, would be really a very very compelling task in, in many many applications. Right, and the many problems are really unsolved. So I, I, I skipped through uh, all of those math parts, but, but there are many new problems there which are very difficult to be solved. <laughs> I, I didn't have time to talk about that. So there are still many problems. If you are interested in this area, there are many theoretical problems. There are many data-driven problems. And, uh, and, and data-driven method seems to be the right way to deal with this problem. So like Indica, so he has uh, tons of data that that we can we, we we can use and and we do not really need to know the equations right so we just have we just need to have data and then we are trying to use the data to learn that right? okay so this is my group and, and the work that i have already presented uh, many of those were done by my students my postdocs and these are my collaborators okay and thank you for your attention <laughs> Thank you for your talk. For the definition of when a system is controllable, uh, you gave that it could be moved from one state to another in a given pair of states. But I imagine that there's other criteria that you could want to have to make a system controllable. Like you know the you know the sequence, not just that it's feasible, uh, so you actually have it in hand, or that it's computationally tractable, or that you have to you can do it with some noise in the system. So you are talking about the the moment part or not the moment part? I, the, I, I guess I'm trying to map the theory to in practice. Okay. Uh, how would yeah. how would you go about using the theory to uh, okay, to so find so, actual ways of controlling the system? Okay, so, so the, the definition is this, right? So now you have a system and then your states, actually the states are functions, functions of your system. So beta could be like different frequencies. So the idea is that you want to steer this function, this population profile, this configuration to another country. So the, the, the definition is that actually if you specify a tolerance, meaning an error, and then if I can always find an input, they can achieve this. So this is your tolerance. And so you, you specify an, an initial test. You specify a final pattern, and then you actually consider any any. So if you can always do this, and this is so for 
example, if you if you look at those uh, animations that I have done, so for star star to maple leaf, actually there is some tolerance that. So for example, as long as I can make the pattern very very close to that shape within this arrow, then that is that is okay. Does this make sense? In finite time, so yeah, in finite time. Yeah. Right. So yeah, so given you know that you can do this. So if you specify this arrow, you know that given within finite time, you can do this. Yeah. So that is the definition of cancelability. So in the example, right? So that is uh, 40, 40 seconds. Right, so that maple leaf. So, so I I specify the pattern, and then, uh, right. So here, I actually specify. I I consider this system, and everything is is is, is set up, right. So I wanted to do this, this, and now I specify that I wanted to reach this in fourteen minutes of time. Now, of course, if you change this time, if you make this shorter, and I guess your amplitude has to larger if you make this longer and the amplitude will be, will be smaller right so this is set and then I design this based on this criteria The path, you mean the path in between? Yeah. The trajectory. Yeah. To the trajectory to go there. Yeah. So that is another that is yeah, another problem. But but the animation that I show that is to reach this pattern within 40 minutes in minimum energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I can I can yeah, so I wanted to do that in the in the minimum energy perspective. Yeah. And and then you can also you can also try to find another criteria for example you wanted to switch this pattern to that pattern given 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 a certain energy level you wanted to reach this in minimum time so there are many different criteria that you can you can have this. what's that yeah, because you can just allow you can just wait forever and then <laughs> Probably, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, defining controllability, you had uh, the field that it's operating within as M. Um, is that M assumed to be constant in these models, or could could that M also potentially vary with some other variable like time or something like that? I mean, uh, when I define controllability. Yes, the the slide you just showed us. This slide. Oh, this one. Yeah, you define the the vector field or or however you want to describe it as M, the space you're operating within. Oh, I mean this. Uh, oh, I mean this. No, the the this field itself. If you look at the the bottom left figure, the right above that that M. Oh, you mean this M? Yes, that M. Oh, so that is just a state space manifold. So that is a state space. So meaning your system is living on this space. Right. So then do you assume that sort of the shape of this state space, you sort of draw it as having some some shape to it? Oh, so this mm -hmm. three-dimensional and then this M would be half. So if you consider a two-dimensional plane. Okay. Yeah, so this is just a... Uh, so then my question is, uh, do you assume that the way it's going to navigate through the system, the way the system is going to respond at any time point is constant? So this is, this is like the space where, for example, uh, what is a good space for your... 
So for example, yeah. Uh, I think that that is um, that that is just a space where your system uh, your system is evolving up. And for example, if you look at this, uh, if you look at oscillators, right? So if you look at oscillators, actually the this M, the M is just this circle. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's, right. So in this case specifically, do you assume that the frequencies are constant? Oh, so in this arithmetic symbol, yeah. I can do the following. I can see there I take four Hodgkin Hospital neurons, and they have different frequencies. I know the frequency. So that frequency is constant. It's constant. Yeah. Uh, so in actual biological systems, that frequency might not be constant. So how do you yeah. plan on evolving the model towards that sort of a system where um, the the state of the system might not constantly be constant. Right. So that's that's really a very good question. So if I do this, I need to make sure that everything is coming, right. And then I design this kind of thing. See what for this system. And for example, if I design this kind of thing, it turns out that when my systems are coupled and they are evolving, and then the, the frequency is drifting, and the frequency is changing. And finally, I will not be able to get to. <laughs> The aggregated feedback is very, very useful. So if you can collect, meanwhile, when you have the evolution, if you can collect measurement data, and then you can use that to 